I just want to say congratulations to each one of you for uh, persevering and sticking it out through Artists Inc. We really do think it's important to train artists to become not only passionate about your work, but um, skilled in the on the business side of things. So go out, succeed, hire people, and uh, fulfill your passions and dreams. Okay, thank you. Hi guys, my name is Thomas Cook. Um, hopefully this is the worst slide you see all night. Uh, but to get started, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland and went to uh, Calvert Hall College High School, which was a private school known for its excellent art program led by Victor Janiszewski, who is a self-proclaimed crazy Polak. Uh, he would put you in a headlock and drop you to the floor if you didn't do your homework. This happened to me multiple times. But he was a great teacher and he taught me traditional rendering in graphite drawing and oil painting. I mostly did landscape, still lifes, and portraiture. It got me ready for college where I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia. I continued my oil painting there, mostly working in portraiture. Um, eventually that slide will come up. There you go. So in this particular piece, I was doing an eight foot tall portraiture uh, piece and I painted every single paisley pattern in the background of this figure. I realized that I liked doing the patterns more than the portraiture at that point. The, Portraits and the patterns both appealed to me because I didn't really know what I wanted to say with my artwork. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of conceptual training. I liked rendering things and I liked making aesthetically pleasing pieces and this way I didn't really have to um, put a lot of background into it. Uh, when I graduated college, I immediately got a full-time job. I bought a house and I started renovating the house. Pretty much stopped doing artwork for about three or four years, unfortunately. Um, there's my house there. Uh, in January of 2009, a long-term relationship I was in ended, and the very next morning as I was drinking coffee, my boss called me and told me that I was laid off from my job. <laughs> so I had no clue what to do next. I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail. That would take me a year to prepare. So in the meantime, my brother knew my situation, called me, and told me that I had an art show lined up at the restaurant he worked at in Baltimore, Maryland. I said, man, that's great, but I don't have any paintings to put in Baltimore, Maryland. He said, well, get to work. So I did. I had a solo show of my uh, pattern paintings. I hung them in Baltimore, Maryland, and then I went off to hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, the trail was a great experience. I had lots of uh, wonderful, amazing stories from it, and I realized what I really wanted to do was illustrate all of these stories in a series of illustrations. Uh, one particular experience that I wanted to tell from the trail was when my friend and I were hiking. We came across a woman who asked if we were hungry and fed us a bunch of uh, fresh fruit. It was an amazing act of kindness. Uh, it blew me away, and I wanted to illustrate her as a saint in this kind of amazing fairy tale like illustration. After the trail, I actually ended up meeting the woman we dated, and the relationship did not last very long. <laughs> now, this great fairy tale I wanted to tell had a different twist to it. It had all these darker emotions tied to it. I didn't know how to express it, and all my attempts turned out really cartoonish and awkward. They weren't me, and I didn't like the way they were going. So I stopped that project, put it to the back burner because it wasn't looking the way I wanted it to. In the meantime, I was tired of my oil paintings in patterns. They weren't really inspiring me anymore. So I dropped all of that and taught myself how to silkscreen. I started silkscreening my patterns and putting dinosaurs in front of it because it looked cool. <laughs> and this kept me busy for about a year and a half to two years. I really liked it, but my soul wasn't really in it. Uh, I didn't want to go back to my oil painting, so as I was sitting in my studio board one night, I came across a photo that I had taken of a dead bird that I found in Savannah, Georgia, years ago before the trail. I decided to paint it on a used um, canvas that I had. I slapped a halo behind it because I wanted to honor the poor creature in its afterlife, and I looked at it and realized that this might be a way that I could go on to tell my stories, all the stories from the trail that I didn't know how to express before. So I started using dead birds and rendering them in my oil painting. I liked the idea of a dead bird because when you think of a bird, it's a beautiful creature flying through the air. When you see it dead on the ground, it's still very beautiful, but it has completely changed from what it was before. So I used these to express my memories of my experiences that had slowly started changing as I grew and as they developed. Uh, I started collecting dead birds, putting them in front of the sceneries that I experienced from the trail and from my other travels, and using different objects to symbolize the other pieces of the story that were going on. Um, everywhere I went, I looked for birds and photographed whatever I could find. My friends realized this and started sending me pictures of dead birds as well. <laughs> um, this was great because I have lots of paintings I want to do. I have lots of paintings I have done and I still have more that I want to keep doing. If you want to come see all of my paintings and if you want to hear about the stories behind them, 
I invite you all to come see my East Austin studio tour. It's stop number 120 at 1913 East 17th Street. Um, we are going to be having an after party on November the 12th, uh, Saturday at 8 p.m. You all are invited. Uh, in the meantime, if you come across any dead birds and you would like to you take a picture of it and send it to me, my email is thomas at thomascookart.com. Guys, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the night. So I'm, I'm Jeremy Thompson, as you saw, a visual artist and a printmaker. My work is inspired by the do-it-yourself ethos and aesthetics of skateboarding, punk, and other counterculture and social and political movements. Customized pop culture iconography is combined in collages that explore the promises and contradictions within Western cultural messaging. Much of my work incorporates the distressed textures of street art and printmaking as an allegory for the decay of the American dream. Born and raised in the UK, I've lived a third of my life in the USA. I've experienced the American experiment from a unique perspective that continues to inform my work. For as long as I can remember, I've had a thirst for all things American. As an awestruck child, I looked to imported TV shows for a glimpse of this idyllic world attempting to recreate it in play. Life seems so much more colorful, easygoing, and exciting in the USA. This obsession and escapism continued into my teen years when, in addition to TV and movies, I started taking visual and cultural cues from American surf and skateboard magazines. Without realizing it, this interest developed into a passion for graphic design, brand identity, and marketing. With limited artistic options at school, I pursued history, geography, and economics, which I continued to study at university. However, after graduation, it became necessary I needed to choose a career I could be passionate about. It didn't take me long to realize I needed to focus on becoming a graphic designer. Over the next 15 years, I worked with brands including the NBA Charlotte Hornets, Kia Motors, Jordan Sneakers, and Time Warner Cable Arena, designing everything from business cards to trade show booths, even robot liveries. Alongside these more corporate clients, I sought out opportunities with skateboard and other action sports related companies. I also began developing various personal projects, one of which became B Streetwear, a line of t-shirts rocked by Del the Funky Homo Sapien on his 2011 tour. The brand was well received and later that year, participated in T-World Magazine's epic Future T-Shirt Graphics exhibition in Sydney, Australia. In addition to Beast, another side project was Art on the Run. Back in the early 2000s, the internet was helping to bring many subcultures to a wider audience. I discovered many of my art heroes were involved in street art, so I started taking photos wherever I went. Over the years, the search for inspiration became a kind of treasure hunt, almost an addiction. Not only did street art inspire me visually, it, also in it was also an education and encouraged me to get my hands dirty, literally. This is uh, Retina in uh, Miami and Buff Monster in uh, San Francisco and Obey in New York City. After seeing so much street art up close and personal, it wasn't long before I was posting my own work on the streets of London, Miami, New York and across the Midwest. I also had the opportunity to have my work shown in street art exhibits in France and Australia. Before I knew it, I had been shooting street art for almost a decade. I now had thousands of photos and decided to share them via an online Flickr gallery. This later became Art on the Run, a series of four self-published books available on Amazon. You can follow us on Instagram at hashtag AOTRbooks. Meanwhile, Beast gradually morphed into just a, more than just a t-shirt brand into what is now my identity as a visual artist, Beast Syndicate. In the last few years, I've moved away from client projects and pursued more artistic opportunities, such as this billboard, part of the Art in the Sky project in Michigan. My relocation to Texas this summer provided a helpful watershed, an opportunity to begin to focus 100% on developing my career as an artist. Not having client projects has enabled me to step away from the computer and concentrate more on developing my own creative process and style. Recently, as a member of the Burning Bones Screen Print Co-op in Houston, I've been exploring printmaking techniques alongside artist Carlos Hernandez. 
I'm also experimenting with an image transfer process using gel medium, taking my custom collages from the computer directly onto wood. I'm excited to announce my first solo art show next Friday at the Binary Space in Bryan. Please come along. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Morgan McKay Teal. I am an artist, choreographer, and arts administrator, currently fulfilling that role um, as working in the College of Fine Arts at UT. I'm artistic director of Dance Waterloo, and I serve on the advisory board for Emerging Arts Leaders of Austin. I grew up in a small town called Crestview, Florida. It's about 30 minutes outside of Destin, if you're familiar with that area. Two loving parents and a brother. Um, my parents were constantly um, encouraging me to uh, pursue my work artistically um, and um, uh, working towards exploring leadership skills. Um, this is an image of me uh, picking my site for my first site-specific dance when I was five years old. Um, my grandmother paid me $10 for this production and um, I was hooked on choreographing ever since. Um, when I was in high school, I fluctuated between dance, theater, and um, math. I know it's a weird combination, but math plays a big role in my um, artistic process. Um, I ended up pursuing my BFA in dance performance and choreography at the University of Southern Mississippi. While I was in school at Southern Miss, um, there was a tornado that completely destroyed our per performing arts center, so I had no longer access to um, work in a stage setting for my choreography and started working with dance film. Um, working with dance film, um, I created my first dance film called Dalette in an abandoned um, schoolhouse and I explored architecture and how it um, interacted with the audience, um, creating an intimate setting with the camera. I also wrote my thesis on this. Um, while I was a senior in school, I thought, what am I waiting for? Let's go ahead and apply for funding and um, speak at research symposiums and concert, uh, uh, conferences about my work. Um, so I had uh, went ahead and started to apply for funding for my work. Um, upon graduation, I, um, with my BFA in dance performance and choreography, um, I moved here to Austin um, in 2014 of May. And I, I never came to visit here. I just up and moved. <laughs> Um, when I had first moved here, I developed an interdisciplinary dance making curriculum called Storybook Dance Making. It's basically a choreographic composition class for children um, that uh, also um, merges other art forms into the dance making process. Um, I've eventually expanded this curriculum um, to include families as a whole. During my first year here, um, I started to question my identity as an artist and I was getting um, more interest in my work from the visual art world than I was the dance world. Um, so I wondered if dance could be a visual art um, versus a performance art. Um, so I created Architectures. It was my first, um, my, my first artist residency. I went to Seaside, Florida to do this um, for Escape to Create. It's actually where I'm from. So um, this this uh, film that I had created was about my adolescence and childhood growing up in this area. In 2015, I created Dance Waterloo, um, and we do programming and performances for our community of Austin right here in Texas. Um, while creating um, performance works here in Austin. Um, we primarily work in public space, um, currently a partner with Art in Public Places, um, performing at public artworks and doing classes at public artworks as well. I'm currently working on a piece, however, with the contemporary Austin um, using Orly Ganger's um, work. I really, really love my community of Austin here. Um, the mission of Dance Waterloo is to cultivate community through dance, and I don't take that um, 
uh, lightheartedly. Um, I really love investing in relationships with my community, with my dancers, with participants, with my audience, and with the public space itself. My name is Morgan McKay Teal, and um, you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Dance Waterloo, and my email is listed here as well for business purposes. <laughs> works of art on plastic paper. I have a particular interest in the mind and its infinite universe. My work uses color and shape as symbols that manifest themselves in modern icons, that is, meditative images that point to something metaphysical beyond their existence as art objects. Uh, my family are the original pioneers of Texas settling the land in the 1800s with Stephen F. Austin. I grew up in Dripping Springs back whenever it was only population 1300 and open country with lots of cattle ranches. And I really love my Texan heritage. I started my career making paintings of red figures on white backgrounds and these were made with red India ink on red paper. This one's called the Spectre. <laughs> I started my career, oh, I was concerned with the idea that a, a human body could be this fragile sack of blood existing in an overwhelming existential space. And that who I think I am is largely a construction of unknowable forces and perhaps reality is only imaginary. The work was about trying to understand the mysteries of the mind and my own struggle with existentialist philosophy. And I used figures to show a panic in the realization of the fragility of life. Red is a highly symbolic color that for me has always represented blood. And I have searched my preoccupation with blood throughout my career. In 2014, I became gravely ill and was diagnosed with a rare genetic disease of the colon. My life changed in the biggest way and I became a sick person with low energy, drugs, and doctors and lifestyle changes. Self-care became the biggest part of my life and I was too sick to work for nearly a year. But however, my work changed to become these indirect abstractions expressing pain and the mysterious and fragile parts of life. Um, and I realized that the inside of the body was just as mysterious and unknowable as the reaches of the mind. Then I became interested in color, the color blue as a powerful symbol of mystical experiences. I learned of the weather phenomenon, the Garua, at the same time that I was reading an anonymous medieval text called The Cloud of Unknowing. And both of these things kind of work together to, um, to manifest my interest in blue. Garua is a super dense, low-hanging cloud that's perfectly transparent. You wouldn't know you encountered a Garua unless, um, unless you walked into it and you'd become soaking wet. Um, all of these, um, The Cloud of Unknowing was a kind of a manual on um, contemplative mysticism that is a way to have experiences of God or the spirit realm. So I began to make these paintings that express symbols of my own spirituality using blue to represent clouds and waters and those were even further symbols of mystical experiences of, of God. The color red continued to be an important aspect of my work representing blood, life, humanity, mortality, body, physical reality, and while blue is swirling around, showing, showing the, the interwoven nature of the visible and invisible realm. This painting is called When You Awake Your Body is Covered with Dew Drops. It's about how when we sleep, sometimes we have uh, experiences that are beyond dreams, sometimes we actually have visions. And the idea is that whenever you awoke, there would be physical evidence on your body. That would be your skin deckled with dew drops as a sign that you had visited the spirit realm. My last series takes things a bit outside of myself and interweaves metaphors of nature and religion. This piece is called the Thick Red Sea and uses both a union archetypical shape and a commonly known biblical event, the crossing of the Red Sea, to show our journey as humanity of fearfully walking toward fearfully walking forward with great trust and wonder. 
and I continue to integrate Jungian archetypes, like in this one, the heart and contemplative mysticism into iconic imagery. As I consider my spirituality, my fragile diseased body, and my role as an artist, I look for ways to continue to express the beauty, mystery, and melancholy of our human experience. Please visit my website or connect with me on social media. I also will be exhibiting in the East Austin Studio Tours this year on Stop 302, my studio's at Pump Project. I'm Heidi Petrie, and I was born and raised in New Orleans. My uncle, Willie Willie Lump Lump, was an artist. I tried to pass off a trace cover of a Charlie Brown book as an original. He instantly called me out, saying, I know you trace this, now go back and do it without tracing. So I did, and when I returned, I remembered his shock at how close I was. I immediately felt power. <laughs> I don't have a copy of that drawing, Oh, 20 seconds is longer than I thought. <laughs> wow, I thought I practiced. Man. Sorry, I needed to stop. Uh, maybe, and maybe it did. <laughs> it's like I thought, oh, there we go. That was just a long 20 seconds. Was it? Okay. I don't have a copy of that drawing, but I do have this. Probably my earliest surviving work. The funny thing is, David is not my brother, but my first crush. I guess I was trying to figure him out as the ideal son-in-law in his orange jumpsuit. <laughs> and might I add that my mother is really rocking that ball gown. So I guess I thought she was just walking around in evening dresses all day. Really? This is like <laughs> Okay. It tells me it's gone. I'm sorry. That's okay. All right. By looking at these photos, it's hard to believe my parents were an artist. My mother restored antiques to put us through school, and my father was always the funny man. This is where the humor in my work comes from. I was drawing from the TV guide while other kids were playing. My parents didn't discourage me. They just had no idea anyone could have a career in art. But I did end up in art school. Oh, yay. People ask how I got to this point. My response is usually, I've been raising kids and husbands my entire life. I got the kids raised, but I had no hope for the husbands. After I got rid of them and my daughters were pretty much grown, I decided to give the art thing an honest try. These are my beautiful daughters, born one year apart to the day by an hour and a half. And Lula. It's Lula. She's very supportive. During those years, I did create, but mainly to make a living by doing graphics and dog portraits. In 2005, we moved to Bay St. Louis, a small artsy town on the Mississippi Gulf Coast five weeks before Katrina. Nine feet of water later, I moved to Hattiesburg, which connected me with wonderful artists and friends. Mississippi gets a bad rap, but I was embraced and encouraged there. When I decided to get serious, I started painting large-scale nudes in questionable situations. The cupcake painting is actually my only surviving pre-Katrina painting. I then began applying for grants and residencies, and every year something positive happened, so I just kept moving forward. Then I had this idea that I wanted to paint yellow rubber gloves. From that, this girl was created, one who had power, could do things on her own. She didn't need a man to fix it. I was accepted to a show of Mississippi artists and was shocked when I was announced best of show. My art was so different than most Mississippi art. And there I am accepting my award. My shoes were a big hit, apparently. <laughs> I kept painting my rubber glove girl and put her in many different situations. Recently, they had a best of show show of the winners. I became the poster child. Like I said, Mississippi has been very supportive and they've awarded me a fellowship, shows, and given me endless encouragement. Wow. Okay. In 2014, I was featured in the SIP magazine and I was an artist for a Festival South. I paint al alone on a daily basis and it's hard to realize that people are out there keeping an eye on what you're doing. I was then awarded a six month residency in Navasota, Texas. There isn't much to do in Navasota, so I immersed myself in my art. 
I did, however, return to Mississippi for a, show, a solo show called Time and Flies, highlighting the work I did during my residency. I'm heavy on nostalgia growing up in the 70s, so we had vintage bikes, old brands of candy, Schlitz beer. It was really great. There's a photo of me and my model. I had another feature in a magazine called Dime. It had an eight-page pull-out poster with one of my paintings. I did learn one lesson. Skyping wine and PJs, not the best way to give an interview. They really put in everything that you say. I received so much exposure from this article, people still tell me they have the poster hanging on their wall. Lula again. As I said, there wasn't much to do in Navasota, so I started going to the library and noticed they still had the old borrower cards in the back of the book. I asked the librarian if I could take the cards, but I still felt like I was stealing something. <laughs> it wasn't until I had the idea to draw something related to the story that I got really excited about this project. After that, I became obsessed. That project spawned a show of 25 original drawings in Telluride called A Permanent Record. It was the first time I ever saw snow. Being from New Orleans, the closest thing we get is drive through daiquiris. <laughs> Next July, I'm showing them at the Georgetown Library with 60 originals. I'm also launching a Kickstarter later this year to produce a library card book. I just had another show in Mississippi about motherhood and growing up in the 70s called Domestic Blisters. It's a wonder anyone survived during that time. We drank from hoses, didn't use car seats, rode our bikes in the mosquito, mosquito truck poison. Being from New Orleans, we're always looking for an excuse to dress up. So we all wore vintage dresses. Those are my grandmother's gloves. I'm drinking water. <laughs> Saying. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I look forward to connecting with each of you and creating more art here in Austin. So I have always loved drawing. Even as a little girl, I was always drawing. I drew a lot of animals. I drew stories about my pets. I had a lot of time to draw because I was homesick a lot with asthma from school. So I would stay with my nana and granddad because my mom would be at work. And my whole family was full of really cool, creative people. That's my mom in the middle. That's a quilt that my nana made. She did sort of painting hybrid quilts. So. Another really cool hobby that my grandparents had was playing Japanese RPGs, and they were very methodical about it. They always had this strategy guide for each one. So as a little kid, I loved to look through the strategy guides at the character pages and copy the characters and their cool outfits. And um, I was very, very influenced by that, by Japanese art. I didn't even realize as a kid, but that's a huge influence of mine. So. You can see in my current drawings, um, their outfits are very similar. I love working with patterns and textures and layering and costumes and drawing hobos and travelers and crust punks and all sort of cool outcast people. So usually when I draw, it's in a sketchbook. This is just a few of them that I've filled up throughout the years. I always have my little pencil pouch with me. Um, so one thing about drawing a lot in sketchbooks is it's hard to share your work. So what I started doing was scanning my drawings from the sketchbooks and self-publishing zines. So um, <clears throat> Creamy Life is my sketchbook compilation zine, and the top three are their own sort of standalone comic book stories. I also do digital illustrations. So this is a graphite pencil drawing that's scanned into the computer. And you can see in the photo, I'm using my tablet to digitally add the color in Photoshop. And I usually have a kitty cat in all of my drawings. <laughs> so bikes are a big theme in my drawings. Um, I'm a cyclist myself, and I just love the feeling of freedom and self-reliance and independence. And I love how bikes can be visually sort of um, infinitely customized to really reflect the personality of the rider. And same thing with skateboards. It's just such a cool way to um, 
like a cool visual manifestation of your personality and your individuality. So these are all drawings except for the middle is a painting. I studied painting in college. Um, this is a progression of one painting. It started out as a silly assignment piece up in the left and this painting is special because it's when I really started getting comfortable with exploring abstract mart making and um, just kind of figuring out a different direction besides uh, just drawing. So this is the one that came next. This is a pretty big painting and this shows the progression. It was just a very long and layered learning experience, but um, it was really cool to discover this whole other side of my process that's so different from drawing, but also came so naturally to me. So over the years, I've been working to meld the two together, my character illustrations and my abstract paintings. So this painting is um, referenced from a photo that I found when I was in New Orleans. You can probably tell it's the Career de Mardi Gras Festival. And you can see the little doggies there at the bottom. <laughs> And this is um, my second most recent painting now. This is Hobo Santa. So sometimes I'll just go through my sketchbook for inspiration. And I just love this scraggly Hobo Santa so much. I feel like he didn't turn out quite as scraggly in, in the painting, but <laughs> I'm really happy with him. So I will have an open studio at the East Austin Studio Tour. I'm number 163. And I would love for everyone to come by and see the rest of my paintings. You can find me online. There's my cute pets and me on my bike. <laughs> uh, my name is Jared Fernandez. I'm a visual artist. I focus on drawing and installation. Um, I was born in Mexico. I got a degree from the University of Texas at Brownsville. And then I went to Michigan State University to get a master's degree. And I originally went into the painting program. Um, as soon as I got there, I realized that painting wasn't for me, and I totally dropped it, and I started drawing. After this, I realized that everything was drawing to me. I was also a, a drawing a teaching assistant, so everything completely became drawing to me. And since the very beginning, my work has always been uh, about the relationships between uh, us as human beings and nature, and I often find similarities and dichotomies and also patterns between the two. I started to explore drawing as installation with a series of drawings called Instinct Instinctive Mechanism. And it was around this time where I started to be interested in seeing my work as individual entities in a space, taking inspiration from the complexity of nature and its many ecosystems and species and subspecies. After this, I wanted to explore drawing further and I wanted to draw with materials, but I also wanted to use materials to, te to tell the story um, about our human condition with nature. So I started to make artwork that was constructed from found materials and also from fabricated parts. The work became very fragile and extremely temporary. The image on left is Foam City, and on the right is Foam City's second manifestation. <clears throat> then I moved on to my thesis show where I started to introduce actual organisms. I started to use plants. Uh, this is a one hydroponic system and tons of bubble phonic systems with maybe about 25 plants. And with the same idea of taking the space in consideration, then I started to create pieces that were part of a bigger piece or like an ecosystem. This has been the most ambitious project and I've never done anything like this again where I introduce organisms. It's something I really want to do, but Maybe I can get there again. So I started to go back, take a step back and started to work with installation again. This is called dwellings and is part of hybrid colonies. And in hybrid colonies, I was exploring living spaces uh, by insects and how they are very similar to our own spaces. I started to get into public art. This was my first 
public art uh, installation temporary also. It's called Los Balcones and it was inspired by the limestones of Bull Creek and also how they create a sense of community and I wanted to recreate the same idea. <clears throat> this is called In Production and a couple of months ago I had a, an opportunity to show at a space in San Antonio and this was the first time where someone just gave me a space and just let me do whatever I wanted. So I started to realize that what I wanted with my installations was that it's basically a drawing. So I just went in there with tons of material and made something. And so this is what happened. A lot of the materials come from thrift stores or anywhere I can find them. And the uh, image on the left is glass that probably came from physics or chemistry department in Michigan. And then after that, I uh, was able to show this again at the Mexican American Cultural Center, and this became the second manifestation. So when I talk about second manifestation, I take the same parts and rearrange them. So they turn into a different state of the same, the same uh, uh, being. And this is what I'm doing right now. Uh, this is called Geoscape, and this is a concept sketch for uh, the city of Austin. Uh, temple and it's going to be 30 pyramids, two different colors and it's going to pop up in three different parks in uh, each park in a different pattern and I guess that's all. My name is Jared Fernandez. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Hill and I'm a ceramics artist. I use a porcelain clay body to create tactically engaging vessels. Some are clearly for use, while others reference this potential. Early in my career, I thought I'd like to make pottery, objects that are well-crafted with a defined use. I even had one family member who briefly made pots. This was my great-great-aunt who earned a PhD in botany and lived to be 100 years old. So I looked to be, I, sorry, I looked to the botanical world for information. I like the way a fruit or a vegetable can look lively and even animated. Sprouts suggest to me growth and even transformation. Pieces like these fully transformed from referencing function to becoming purely expressive. Can you speak loud? My too Okay. Um, the smooth, fleshy elements grow from rough, protective casings. These will inform later work where the structure serves as a habitat. I began to make vessels that had a more built look. Thin, rolled slabs of clay are stacked one by one like a brick wall. The interior is blended, leaving behind a smoother surface to contrast with the outside. I call these tea baths, a play on the tea bowl many potters are referencing. This is a forming method I will use again and again. Exploring how surfaces are built in nature, I notice the soft architecture of industrious creatures who give much energy to build a home, only to abandon it someday. I can appreciate this effort after having lived in many areas of the US. For several years, I had the opportunity to live in Hawaii, which is a great study in contrast. I was honored to be invited to exhibit in Hawaii's Modern Masters. The artwork was displayed at shops along Luxury Row in Waikiki. My insect-inspired hives are here surrounded by designer menswear shoes. <laughs> <laughs> My husband and I lived on Kauai, the Garden Isle, and color became more of a focal point. I worked on a small scale because I could only install a tiny kiln at our rented house. So I showed my work in groupings that could also be sold as individual pieces. These are little hulas and they're only about three inches tall. They even hang on the wall. I invite people to interpret my work based on their own experiences and observations. Pieces like these usually remind viewers of urchins, but my influences are varied and seep into the work very gradually. I also know just enough photography to shoot my work, which has been vital to it since I've been moving around so much. Many ideas are blended. Tiny sea cucumbers and spiky sea stars shot by my husband while diving. Beautiful but terribly invasive ginger plants. And even these bananas grown and harvested in our own backyard. Other influences are pretty apparent. For example, these sea spray cups. I return to functional forms regularly. They are both a complement to more abstract vessels and have the ability to bring a wider audience to my work. 
Not every art form lends itself to being held in the hands and engaged in a moment of physical intimacy. A cup or even a tumbler allows my audience to expand its role from viewer to user. While evoking a sense of, excuse me, while evoking a sense of being even in choppy ocean waters. Further, you can feel every mark, each of which was made by hand. The pot is literally passed from my hands onto yours. There are a multitude of images still lingering in my mind that make their way into my studio. In fact, I first saw these air bladders on sea kelp ages ago in Monterey Bay, California. Textures from the Hawaii rock walls and coconuts from our backyard help to imagine new forms even today. My most recent series combines wheel thrown parts with hand building as I gradually increase the scale of my work. I've made little clay stamps from pieces of kawaii coral to texture the surface and give a nod to yet another, maybe more obvious, inspiration. Today, I continue to explore and remember the textures that I love and use them to build classic vessel forms in clay. My work can be seen in museum and gallery shops such as the Asher Gallery via the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft and even at Women and Their Work here in Austin. This November, I'll be showing at stop number 378 during the East Austin Studio Tours where I'll be hosted by Cloud Tree Studios and Gallery on East Fifth near Springdale. Thank you for letting me share my work with you this evening. Please visit my website for more images and information about the classes I teach and workshops. And feel free to send me an email to be added to my guest book and grab a postcard before you go. I'll have this too. <laughs> my name is Valérie Chassonnet. I'm a sculptor and a painter. I grew up in France. Some of my ancestors were wearing those clothing that Gauguin enjoyed painting. I really love Gauguin and Denabi, so I consider myself a faux painter. Uh, one of my ancestors was an artist. I made this uh, bed with savage wood from the shipyard of the Pride of Baltimore, in part to honor the lineage. I enjoy making functional art. It's uh, pseudo-functional and poetic and humoristic. Here I have a fire holder, a sticky note holder, very important, a pen holder, a another pen holder, a cup holder, and then tiny picture of your spouse holder. That's for your desk. <laughs> um, in the same vein, I use welding rods at drawing tools. This series of sculptures of postcards and love letters is a twist on the lightness and fragility of actual letters, the potential heaviness of a message, the weight of human reality versus digital communication, which is kind of weird, and my feeling of homesickness sometimes. It's a bit nostalgic, this part of my works resonate with uh, my love of museums. When I was 10, we moved uh, to Provence. My high school was named after Cézanne, and we were by the foot of the mountain that he painted. As a college student, I moved back to Paris, where I was born, and uh, I lived in Montparnasse uh, in an apartment above Giacometti's old studio. I was studying Russian and Soviet studies. I spent a lot of time in Russia. Uh, um, I spent a lot of time in Ukraine, uh, and um, when I was there uh, in the Soviet Union, I realized that I was very interested in Siberian anthropology. I then came to the U.S. I was invited as a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley, to, uh, and then the next year went to Canada and uh, do field work. I spent three months in the winter and one month in the summer, and it was an amazing experience. Then at the age of 25, I know I look like I'm 14, uh, I was hired at the Smithsonian to be part of a uh, curatorial team of a major international exhibit, and I worked there for 11 years. I lectured all over the US, and uh, then I even got to do my own, to create my own exhibit, and I produced some writings. Uh, Baba Yaga was how I got into Russian to start with. All along, I wanted to make art, so I started to take night classes at the Corcoran, and uh, these are my first, very first masks that I did, and you can see a blend of Aleut and Eskimo art, as well as African art, which is uh, my first great love. Those Baole masks have been with me, they've been the guardian of my home since I was 19, and some Italian Renaissance architecture where I always see faces. I always want to make masks. I studied a series of very strong women. Calamity Jane was one of my childhood heroes. 
uh, it was, this was uh, photographed, uh, published in a magazine. Um, Joan of Arc is another childhood hero. While I was there, I created, I co-created a collective of women uh, and men and architects and artists called the Washington Heavy School. We were making heavy work, uh, laughing a lot, having a lot of exhibits, uh, wrote a manifesto, it was really fun. Then biology caught up with me. I always wanted to have children. I started having babies. When you have two sons, you learn a lot about the masculine. You also learn some things about the dawn of humanity. Um, I moved to Austin, and uh, I wanted to stay home with my children. I created a little school. We did a lot of art and a lot of cooking. My yard looks like Provence. I did it for 11 years, and I started to make art again, and I started to show my work again. I was invited to be part of the Mona Lisa project, where uh, 15 of us uh, women artists were posing as Mona Lisa. We took the photo and made an art piece with it. It placed uh, in the top 25 at Art Prize at Grand Rapids, Michigan, which was really pretty awesome. And it was at the People's Gallery as well. And it helped me make friendship, uh, invaluable friendships with these women. Donna Renzo in the red dress was my first welding teacher. Uh, last year I did West and created a collective of women blacksmith, badass women blacksmith and metal <coughs> artists. My current series is influenced by Japanese UKOA, just like uh, French Impressionist 100 years ago, going back to the sources. It's about the women condition, the frailty, but also the strength of women, and ultimately about love, which is what matters most in the end. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, y'all. My name is Arielle Austin, Newt, R-E-L, unlike the Little Mermaid, and Yes, my last name is Austin. No relation to Stephen or why I live in the city in the first place. <laughs> uh, I was actually born and raised in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, California. Um, I am a abstract painter. I also incorporate dried flowers into my work as well. I'd say the process of creating and making has always been really constant in my life, but it wasn't until my last three years of undergrad that I really fell in love with the process. Um, however, I decided to be practical and I got my degree in graphic design instead. And my goodness, was I miserable. <laughs> um, and for any post-grad, that's kind of a terrifying realization if you can only imagine. It took about a season or a year of depression for me to really realize that design was no longer God's calling for my life. So I did the only other thing I knew how to do. I prayed and I painted. And to paint was to meet with God. It was to push through the frustrations and the darkness and the thoughts in my head that I didn't have real words for. It, was and still is my therapy. I painted my fears, I painted my triumphs and my breakthroughs, I painted the affirmation being sung over me that the light and my God in me is far bigger than depression and my value spans far more than any college degree or accomplishments. Um, it was actually Matthew C. Brown, a photographer that I was interning for in Long Beach, that really encouraged me with the idea that there is no such thing as following your dreams someday. It either happens today or it doesn't happen at all. So I promptly quit my job and started a website. Uh, a few months after that, I held my first gallery show in a little boutique in my hometown. Um, it was in that moment that I knew I was right where I was supposed to be, um, creating and making and connecting other people through the process. Uh, since then, there have been small and large steps and moments of vulnerability and bravery and sharing my art through ministry and social media, Society6, opening my own online shop, um, saying yes to art walks and art talks and commission work. Um, in August of 2015, I took my largest leap of faith, packed up my car, and moved to Austin, Texas. 
It was the scariest and most freeing thing that I've done in my life thus far, but I'm so incredibly grateful to just be embraced by the city's awesome community, um, both in art and outside of it. Uh, since in the year that I've been here, I held a few pop-up shops at West Elm. I was a featured artist for Boss Babes ATX Meet Her Hand series. I have my work at a few local shops on consignment, and I was a part of a group exhibition on the East Side's 6th District. Over the summer, I completed my largest commission to date, which was a 60 by 60 floral mixed media piece. Um, quite the task working out of my 400 square foot studio apartment, but a uh, humbling and, and great one at best. Um, it's been really awesome and really amazing to experiment and experience my art outside of just the canvas and having shops and businesses kind of recognize that as well. I'd say my work explores a lot with layers and textures. I love those moments where a piece just kind of draws you into it, where you have to come a little bit more intimate, a little bit more vulnerable, kind of see it for what it is. Um, and dissect its layers a bit to uh, kind of like our own human nature and desire to want to connect with one another. I also, <laughs> with the dry flowers, um, kind of my own rendition, my perspective of, of bringing a new life to something that was once beautiful. I'm excited to continue to grow as an artist here in Austin, as well as a woman, as well as a woman of color. Um, I look forward to the day that I can open up my own art studio and invite others in to paint and create and heal alongside with me. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name is Luisa. I'm originally from Colombia and I'm a textile designer and now transitioning to be a fiber artist. Um, I studied industrial design and when I graduated, like everybody else, I felt like I knew a little bit of something but nothing really. I started my first job, I was pretty miserable but I always noticed, I started noticing that I really like surfaces, how you see things from up close patterns and then how they reveal something when you're looking at it from afar. So tr through traveling and starting to look into doing fabrics, I moved to the UK to pursue my, gra my master's degree in textile innovation. When I came back to the States, teaching fell into my hands and I absolutely loved it. Some of them are definitely Satan's children, but some of them are really good and motivated me. So I teach everything from basic weaving, dyeing, and then equipment stuff. And I started, I continued doing my work, which, which is basically doing structures with fabrics. So these are some examples of like just uh, pursuing repetition with paper and then transitioning into doing it with fabrics. So the first thing I started doing was just using different techniques to create three dimension within fabrics. So using stretchy fabrics, using pad loft, which is what you have inside the baseball caps, and then using different stitching techniques like embroidery, but always at uh, the beginning using fabric as my canvas and then started working on it towards looking for that structure that I was looking for. So I developed, it, I developed my own techniques, um, drove me insane a little bit. But uh, it was interesting to start using my past as an industrial designer to uh, incorporate processes, chemicals, folding, and different things. So if you see the pattern on the top, it's a basic pattern that I started using to create these different fabrics that have something in the front and something in the back. When you see the pattern, you also see that the, the embroidered part has another pattern within it and that embroider pattern is going to help me make the threads react in, into a certain way. And I also experimented just using the same pattern and then using uh, different ways on, of embroidering on it. So um, if you notice, it's a still the, it is still the same pattern, but then the front and the back of the fabric looks different. 
Again, another example of the same pattern, but then stitching different areas on it to create another, another beautiful structured fabric. So I really love this part of experimenting, having a canvas and then this using the different embellishing techniques to create structure. But then I noticed that if I could get into the threads, I will have more control over it. So I got some training into how to use jacquard looms. So the picture you see on the left is how the software works. And then how to use different qualities of yarns, like spandex with cotton, with wool. So when you take it all out of the loom, it reveals a different um, quality to it. So these are called double cloths. They happen on a jacquard loom. So you're basically weaving two fabrics and choosing where to join them. And then I translated that onto knits, which is another type of fabrication for fabric. So I really enjoyed this part and it brought a lot of opportunities uh, to show as a designer. And uh, I've been selling fabrics as finished products like pillows and throws in museum stores, boutique stores, and places like that. But then Artist Inc. happened this year also with the 30s crisis. So I, I felt like I should go back into making art and looking at how architects and people from different fields is using fibers, is using yarns, and is using fabric construction techniques. I thought about a new project that I'm currently working on. So the one on the left is a refugee shelter for, child, for refugees, sorry. And then these pictures are about having even more control towards com creating complex curves with fibers. The one on the right is Saha Hadid, and the one on the left is architect Thomas Heatherwick. It's, um, it's a facade of a um, hospital. So moving forward, um, I started looking and interacting with architects on what I needed to do, which is basically learning a parametric software that will help me have more control over the threads and how they need to interact with each other to create complex shapes like the one you see on the left. So finally, something um, in, within the last two weeks, I had a publication on um, Architecture Magazine. So um, it seems like an installation is on its way. I was introduced to Batik in my early 20s when I was in college majoring in women's studies and writing poetry. I was invited to display a poem at a group show and I was looking for an interesting way to display my poem. Someone suggested writing in batik. I made a banner with a poem written in batik and dyed the fabric purple. This was the beginning of my love affair with batik. This project was made in the pre-digital age, so unfortunately I don't have much documentation of my work. Over the years, I made batik designs in my spare time and was eventually drawn to collage through the trials and tribulations in design. I became interested in experimenting with the color in the fabric and I started using the collage to create collage designs. I found that I prefer this style of design to the more traditional batik and have always enjoyed the surprises that occur. I moved to Austin in 1997 and met my husband Ethan Azari in 99. Ethan is also an artist and my story moving forward is very much connected to my life with Ethan. The first year we were dating he decided to have an art show in his house which he called the in-house gallery. For 15 years we hosted the annual in-house gallery art shows. We also participated in the East Austin studio tour. Initially, I provided a support role for these shows, making flyers and doing the mailing list and so on. Having an in-house gallery art show is a huge undertaking. We would clear out the whole house and stack everything in our bedroom. We even moved the fridge into the bedroom on the show days. <laughs> the best way for me to describe it is that it's like moving house without actually moving anywhere. <laughs> it was kind of fun and crazy and lucrative. We would laugh or sometimes I would cry about the things that got stacked up in the bedroom. Guest artists at the in-house gallery shows included Tim Kerr, Felice House, Tim Doyle, Rachel Coper, and Alison Lipkin, to name a few. In the early years that we hosted the in-house shows, I had a regular job that always created art. I began having greeting cards. I'm going a little slow and it's moving faster than I am, so <laughs> anyway, that's what I was doing. Um, <laughs> in 2008, I was invited to show my art for the Azarian Family Art Show in Montpelier, Vermont. Everyone in Ethan's family is an artist. My mother-in-law, Mary Azarian, is a woodcut artist, and she won the Caldecott Award for Snowflake Bentley in 1999. For the Azarian show, I displayed framed original collage artworks, and this was a pivotal moment for me. I stopped making greeting cards and began to focus more on making framed original artworks for the in-house gallery shows. There we go. I caught up. <laughs> in 2009, our son Francis was born. Ethan and I discussed ways for me to be able to stay home with Francis. 
I remember him saying to my midwife, midwife GB that he thought I should become an artist, and she responded that many new parents find creative ways to stay home with their babies. I was not completely convinced, but thought I would give it a try. In May 2010, I quit my job at UT to stay home with my son and make art. Essentially, he has been raised in an art studio. Art shows were set up around him. He would play with the artworks while we were setting up, and he would be at many of our art shows with us. It is a lot for a small person, and often our worlds were turned upside down during these disruptive and intensive few months. <laughs> there have been many challenges throughout the process, but some things he may take away from the experiences are adaptability and creativity. So, <laughs> call it up again. We knew the time would come for us to either rent a studio space or have a studio built. Our home is 900 square feet, and we were working in one small room together and making the art shows in our home. We decided to have a 200 square foot studio built in our backyard. Our new studio is called Blue Cow Studio. It is beautiful and sunny and we now have a separate space to exhibit during East and our holiday show. Blue Cow Studio is fiscally sponsored by Austin Creative Alliance and receives grant funding from the city of Austin. After 15 years, it feels amazing to finally have our home as a home and have an art, show, art studio to work in. So before Francis started school, we shared our time between Austin and Vermont. I began to notice a trend happening with my art making. I seem to be working with the seasons and making flowers and bird art in the spring and swimming pieces in the <coughs> summer and snow art during the winter in Vermont. For the last four years, I have participated in the Blue Genie Art Bazaar, and for these shows, I made a series of art prints that include the Chinese zodiac animals and a bird series with cardinals and blue jay, peacocks, and hummingbirds. This year, I also have a monarch butterfly's print as well as an artwork inspired by Barn Springs. So, I'm too fast, I'm too slow. <laughs> My long-term goal is to illustrate children's books. I've worked on some ideas, but so far time seems to be the elusive thing. And prioritizing day-to-day -day needs, such as make a making a living as opposed to long-term goals, has been challenging. This is where I found myself at the beginning of Artist Inc. This course has already helped me create schedules and plan for my short-term and long-term projects. <laughs> I now found myself in a position where it feels more possible to make a living from art. This year, Ethan and I learned about the grant writing process, and after a year of growing pains, I feel optimistic about making art work in the long term, and I'm very excited about the possibilities. So thank you to Artist Inc. and to Calder and to all the facilitators, and especially to Jeanette and my small group. I've learned so much from you all over the last eight weeks, so it's really been great. And we, Blue Cow Studio is number 117 on the East Austin Studio Tour. Um, I'm Lindsay Lindbergh. I'm the owner of local entertainment agency, Austin Oddities and Entertainment, as well as I'm known for my superhero alter ego, Mama Lou American Strong Woman, and the co-producer of the not-for-profit Austin Busker Project. Here's how these projects became a large part of my life. Um, I was always a performer. As a child, I was, wanted to be in the circus or a ballerina. When I was in high school, I was into musical theater, opera. My first job is that I worked at a science museum as this character, Loretta LaRue, the, strong, or the um, fashion consultant. And then when I was 19, I joined a clown theater company and we moved to New York City to do clown professionally. <laughs> <laughs> in New York City, I chased all my dreams and after graduating from college, I decided to run off and join the circus. I auditioned for two French circus schools, but I didn't make it into either one of them. And I became very depressed with the idea that I wasn't good enough to be chosen to learn more. But going into that dark place and through the rejection, I learned something very valuable to the rest of my life. That, no one gets to tell you that you're good enough to practice more. Only you get to decide that. So I decided that instead of waiting to be approved of, it was me who was gonna decide to create the rest of my life. And I made a list of the things I wanna accomplish in the next five years, circus school or no circus school. I, so at that point, I decided to move to Montreal, Canada, where I could train with professional coaches on my own terms. Now in Canada, you can street perform without a working visa. So to make ends meet, I started street performing on the sidewalks and I created a strong woman persona that was sassy, strong, and so lovely. And I quickly fell in love with being Mama Lou's strong woman. My life changed forever. Over the next few years, I developed my act. As Mama Lou Strongwoman, I tear whole telephone books in half, I roll up frying pans, bend metal bars, crush apples in my biceps, and explode hot water bottles. 
I have five Guinness World Records. I've performed my act in 12 different countries and I've been featured on TV shows globally. And I've started a resurgence in the strong woman culture and interest in that. Um, my work and my world literally blew up. I thought Mama Lou was just a fun novelty act, but I soon realized that I had found something that our society really needed, a strong woman to believe in. I'm most proud to be named to more magazines first top 50 fierce women list alongside Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, and Lady Gaga. But the most important thing of all is that I realized that what I was doing made a difference. That boys and girls who adore this superhero in polka dots changed how I saw what I was creating. Dads would come up to me and shake my hand and say, my little girl wants to grow up and be just like you. Thank you. And so I realized that you have to realize that what you do makes a difference because it really does. In 2012, I wanted to give back to the art form that empowered me and started everything, busking. So I signed on as co-producer for the Busker Hall of Fame, which is a podcast dedicated to creating a living oral history of street performers and the crazy characters in our world, and founded the Austin Busker Project locally to support, promote, and advocate busking in Austin, Texas. But life has a way of sneaking up on you. In 2012, I suffered an injury that almost wiped out my entire strong woman career. Um, without any income. And I realized that I was a working artist, sure, but I did not have a backup plan and nobody to depend on. So I started feeling the effects of 10 years of tearing telephone books, tendonitis crept in, and I realized I couldn't be a strong woman forever. So I needed to decide what would come next in my life. I decided to channel the world I knew, I loved, give back to my city, and empower artists to create the world around me. And in 2013, I started Austin Oddities and Entertainment, a specialty full production entertainment agency for circus performers, original offbeat talent, everything in between. Austin Oddities is everything you never imagined. My latest passion project is in bringing to life an intimate full circus production, Miramimodum, which is a circus of dreams. And we got to do our first performance of this at Camp Lucy in June. Throughout Austin Oddities, through being an officially recognized female-owned small business, I've discovered new creative outlets, new challenges, new strengths, and I am so in love with being a small business owner. And I love what we bring to life. It seems that we're doing a good job because we've been recognized with some of the top awards locally, statewide, and nationally. I believe that life, the way it unfolds, is infinitely more wonderful than anything you could have planned. The most important thing to do is have a trajectory, have ambition, and don't be afraid to say yes to all the ridiculous, opportunities that cross your path along the way. Life is not about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself and finding joy in all the small moments. That's me, because I look good in a suit. <laughs> My name is Saul Paul. Not to be confused with Sean Paul, South Park, South Paul. South Paul, I love it, Saul Paul. Uh, it's from the Bible, how I transition from good to bad, dark to um, bad to good, dark to light. I believe life is art. I make art based off of my life experiences. Um, my target audience is people. So, <laughs> where people are, it's usually where I perform. I get to do cool stuff like performing the Super Bowl, America's Got Talent, colleges, universities, government agencies, nonprofits, a couple of TED Talks. Um, wherever there are people at, that's where I'm at. So again, life is art. I have a story that I tell. It's my story of how I went from tower to tower. The first tower is the prison tower. That's like when the dude is with the rifle. And the second tower is the UT tower. I was locked up in the Texas State Penitentiary, convicted to four felonies. And that's when I went from Saul to Paul, ultimately got out of prison and graduated from the prestigious University of Texas in Austin. I am primarily a musician with the message. That's my primary craft. I make music. My latest project is called Tower to Tower 2. Uh, my first project, I talk about tragedy and triumph. My second project, I talk about what it's like to be living my dream. What I call living my dream is dreaming in 3D. That's my creative way of saying, make your dreams your reality. Uh, this is a book. I wrote a book called Dreaming 3D. It's based on a song that's on my album. I took the lyrics and annotated the lyrics and ultimately turned it into a book because for me, life is art and I like to reach any and everybody. Uh, I have a mobile gaming app. It's available on iOS and Google Play. It currently has 100,000 downloads. You can download it, it's free 99. Um, <laughs> what I like about mobile gaming apps is it allows me to use my graphic design skills, my sound design, my storytelling, 
Uh, but I partnered, uh, I love collaboration, so I partnered with Dakota and created the mobile gaming app. My motto is no audience member left behind. So I want to reach everybody. So I created a children's book. It's based on the song that's on my album, Tower to Tower 2 as well. It's called Rise. Um, I often write these songs, I feel multi-layered. So I take the lyrics and there's more to it than just the music that's involved. So that's why I create more around it. Um, we have a clothing company called My Right Clothing. Um, that's one of the shirts, this is one of the shirts. The motto for our company is, um, re it's, the company's called Reroute. We believe a story well told can change the world. And I believe we can tell stories in different ways, whether it's through a film, whether it's through a song, whether it's through a slogan. Um, the theme that's consistent through all my art is serving people. I learned that from my grandmother. My grandmother, she adopted me when I was three years old because my mother passed away when I was three. I never met my father, but she was awesome. I didn't know how awesome she was until she passed away later in life. So all that I do, I dedicate to her. I'm a musician with the message. People ask me, what's the message? The message is, be the change. This is what I believe. I believe we all share the same planet, but we each live in our own world. So I'm saying to you, make a difference in the world you live in. You don't have to go start a nonprofit, you don't have to be a millionaire, you don't have to move to a third world country. You can just make a change right where you are. Be the change. Uh, myself, I do that by working with youth. So whether it's an elementary school, whether it's a high school, whether it's a middle school, I make sure that uh, in addition to me being an art artist, me sharing my art, me expressing myself, that somehow I'm giving back and serving the community. Um, I believe in working smarter, not harder. So instead of, again, separating my social good from my service, from my work, I, I put the two together. So we created a music and arts festival. So what I want to see young people do is manifest and live their dreams as well. So we host a festival where we travel across the country and work with middle school and high school students. From a business side standpoint, we work with companies like Fender, um, Conbar, and whatever else. All right, so it wouldn't be right if I didn't do some music, uh, but I don't have my guitar, so we'll do it a little bit different. <coughs> Every time I point to y'all, I want y'all to say, be the change. Let's try it one time. I've been thinking about it, you should be the change. Okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I got 20 seconds, people. All right. <laughs> So this right here is cool because what, what I really do when I create music, when I, rather when I, when I create my art, I basically create music, I create art, and then I create a world around it. This is a good example of that. Like for me, it always starts with a song, and then I create these auxiliary projects around it, and I collaborate with other artists and whatnot. So if you'd like to collaborate with me, you should. Like take a picture of that, get in contact with me. I would love to see how we can be creative and collaborate together. But right now, in this moment, let's collaborate. So, you still remember your part, right? Yeah. All right, so check it out. Uh, I've been thinking about it, you should. Be the change. Ain't no doubt about it, you should. Be the change. You can talk about it, sit and complain, or you can make a difference and. Be the change. So when I was a kid, my brother used to always say to me, well, in Omni world, that may be, but this is reality. So welcome to my reality. My name is Andy Kinsey. That's like Andy. That's Andy like Gandhi, but without the G. And I love stories. I love improvisation and games. I'm a writer, producer, director, a teacher. My medium is theater and film. I've been an actor, a milliner, a couch surfer. I'm a mother, a partner, a daughter. I'm basically a Jackie of all trades, but queen of nothing, except Andy World. In the fall of 2011, I put out a call for a group of kids to take a Shakespeare play to the Texas Renaissance Festival school days. They basically had no expectations. I mean, Shakespeare is difficult for many adults to grasp, right? Neither did I have an abbreviated text. I had to create my own kid-friendly adaptation. The kids even lacked basic theater skills. Still, we had something in common with the immortal bard. We shared a love for stories. And what was supposed to be an experiment with elementary aged kids turned into something extraordinary and magical. Without that sense of, you're doing it wrong, we found that we could actually do it right. This is supposed to be a one-time thing. But after it was over, the kid said to me, so when are we going to do the next one? And when a kid says that to you about Shakespeare, I mean, <laughs> you can't really stop. <laughs> so introducing young children to Shakespeare has become a mission. After all, if you can handle Shakespeare, you can handle anything. 
My adaptations are a mix of modern narration and the original Shakespeare verse. It's our gang or little rascals meets Shakespeare. So you are all trying to understand the play. And speaking of play, we play a lot. Sometimes I wonder how we actually even get any of these productions up because we're playing so much. I'm also constantly messing with the scripts. People don't take kids performing Shakespeare seriously, so I can break a lot of rules. I switch characters, <laughs> I divide characters, I delete characters, I even change the sex. So we had Queen Lear, we had a female Hamlet, and a male Ophelia. Um. Yay! <laughs> so I always give girls the chance to change the sex of their character, if it makes sense. I give the boys the same option, but they never take me up on it. <laughs> so you see, in third grade, I wrote a play called The Bad Day, and my teacher let me produce it for the class. It was a terrible script. But it was about a family, and they went to visit the dentist, and they ended up with a lot of cavities. And that was basically the story. <laughs> and uh, despite my incredible skills as a director and my casting preferences, I really couldn't find enough actors, and I had to play the brother. So even though I was the writer, the producer, the director, it didn't even occur to me to switch the brother to a sister. I mean, things haven't changed since Shakespeare's time. We're still seeing the world from a male's point of view. There are still more roles for males than females. We may have the occasional powerful Queen Margaret, but the woman's actions are really still tied to the man's. Now, Shakespeare's dead, folks. <laughs> Why are we still following his patterns? I think the only way to fix things is to actually foster the new Shakespeare's. So I started a project that empowers adolescent girls to write, produce, and direct. It's called Girl Improved, but there's a twist. The projects have to follow the Girl Improved manifest. They must contain at least 50% females who are inclusive and reflect the myriad of shapes, sizes, and colors of girls in our world, and their purpose cannot be centered around romance. The girls hate that part. <laughs> um, no, I am not against love. I love love. Love is great, right? Uh, but that's not all there is to being a female. You can't simply replace us with the sexy leg lamp. <laughs> you know, that's actually a test. It was made up by a woman named Kelly Sue DeConnick. And she said, if you replace the female character with a sexy lamp and the story still makes sense, then you've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, stories, girls, Shakespeare, theater, and film. It all falls under my organization, Improve It Arts, where I'm working to improve arts education. Currently, I have the Improve It Shakespeare Project and the Girl Improved Project. Now, if you like kids, and if you want to empower girls, or if you love playing games and sharing stories, I invite you to join me on my journey. Andy's world, Andy World's borders are actually open to new citizens. <laughs> and I saw everybody else and I totally forgot to put any social media up there. So it's, um, the handle is hashtag 2 Shakespeare or hashtag girl underscore improved. And we have a Shakespeare production November 19th and 20th at the Scottish Rite Theatre. It's the Caesar Fest. We're doing Julius Caesar and then Julia Caesar. <laughs> hey, thank you. I'm Lelena Fisher, an interdisciplinary artist working in Austin from my studio, Lelena Lab. I make acrylic paintings on nostalgic printed fabrics with incongruous shapes stitched in. I also create sculpture that parodies and copes with our macho culture. That's my studio with a couple of pieces in progress. I grew up watching my grandmother sewing these kinds of fabrics parked in a dark nook of a creaky old house in Port Arthur, Texas. The stitches she laid out with her machine served as her only road to autonomy, and her insistence that my mother and her sisters complete college and support themselves introduced me to feminism. I saw a lot of stitches as a child. Here's my mom relaxing in the tub with healed wounds from two mastectomies and a botched implant after several bouts with breast cancer. My aunt went through the same thing, topping it off a few years later with an episode of ovarian cancer and they lived through it. Uh, I moved to Mexico for my last year of college after UT, and the professor I lived with introduced me to Sor Juana, feminist poet and nun in the 1600s. This serigraph was inspired by her poem, Hombres Necios, as well as the Spanish conquest I was reading about in my history classes. It's the first of a diptych. 
Uh, in New York for my MFA at Pratt, I made 2D and 3D works, including several, and several short films using live action and stop motion animation. The films were accompanied by these daggers that I cast in ice and in hard candy so that they dripped down the wall when they were hanging on exhibition. Uh, after that, I worked as a studio assistant to Matthew Barney, as a designer for kids' television, and a graphics editor at the New York Times, where among other things, I diagrammed John Ashcroft's pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> I also played music in several pop punk bands. Uh, my main art form, as a matter of fact, was music for the next 10 years. I ultimately led my own dark pop band, The Color Guard, writing songs that explored the same themes of feminine roles that I had addressed in my visual art. We had heavy guitars and thick harmonies and four independent CD releases. And of course, part of the fun is making the cover art. <laughs> uh, then my mom had ovarian cancer and we confirmed that the family carries a genetic mutation for high reproductive cancer risk. So after moving to Texas with my husband and child, I had a series of preventative surgeries and reconstruction. It, I felt it brought me full circle to the concerns and challenges from my past. My first fine art in 15 years came out of my mother's slow death in 2013. I chose fabric reminiscent of a hospital gown and painted with acrylic and spray paint a memory of accidentally knocking over the cage of my dad's pet bird as a small child. This started me on a track of exploring dividing lines, especially lines dividing periods of time, moments in time when reality is irreversibly changed, like the moment when I lay on a stretcher and signed off on having my reproductive parts removed. So this is my own way of sort of illustrating that moment in time. Uh, I painted children's characters because that was the visual language I was used to speaking after my work in animation and because children have such raw, unrestrained reactions and emotions. I also widened my exploration to the boundaries between interior and exterior, states of consciousness, and states of being, and the transition from 2D to 3D. This four-foot piece is currently hanging at City Hall. I enjoy the contrast between a rigid graphic pattern printed on fabric and the human marks made by a paintbrush. Collaging cut shapes and stitching with embroidery thread allows me to be the surgeon. My daughter and I now play music together in a project we call the Mother Mold, named for the supporting structure of a mold in which one pours casting material to make a sculpture. I hope to pass on more to my daughter than an awful genetic mutation. And this is my mock-up and mold of, uh, of a three-foot resin star with 39 miniature women's shoes suspended inside. These represent the 39 maternal deaths per 100,000 that occurred in Texas in 2012, a year after drastic cuts to the funding of women's health clinics. I plan to also cast it in a material that melts, and I'm taking suggestions on where it might th be displayed. Uh, I look forward to having all of you over to my studio for a day-long outdoor party for the West Austin Studio Tour in 2017. Many thanks to uh, the Artist Inc. team and to all my new and inspiring friends. Hello, my name is Jason Farrell. Um, gosh. Um, I want to share with you two of my passions of my life, that is nature and, out, and photography. My life has been an adventure, and I want to share with you, with you a glimpse of that nature, of that adventure. As a young boy and growing up in Texas, my parents instilled in me a great appreciation of the outdoors. We often traveled to the Colorado Rocky Mountains, uh, and also to the Appalachian Mountains uh, in Tennessee. I uh, did a lot of whitewater rafting. I was in Boy Scouts growing up and just was surrounded with camping and hiking. As I got older, I was often uh, leading groups into the backcountry, into the mountainous areas of Colorado and the Rocky Mountains, teaching wilderness survival techniques and basic backpacking and camping. But this whole time, I was surrounded by immense natural beauty I just couldn't get away from. I got my degree in wildlife biology and spent many summers and uh, seasons out west and now working in national parks, uh, working with bald eagles, with falcons, eagles, owls, hawks. And I was working outside the whole time. It was like a vacation, it was every job. And I just loved being outside and enjoying the natural environment. In 2001, I took an epic trip to Australia 
and I came across this uh, art gallery of Ken Duncan, who is a pioneer of landscape panoramic photography. And I just loved his size of his prints, the, the texture, the colors. It just felt like I was immersed in the scene when I was looking at one of his photographs. This is supposed to be a video. It's not working, but this is a waterfall in Oregon just cascading down these rocks. And I, after I met Ken Duncan, that just changed my whole perspective on photography. And I would spend time waiting hours to collect images like this of that, of that waterfall, um, just carefully comp comp uh, composing it and waiting on the right light. My passion for the outdoors and photography is taking me also around the world. This is a, a photo of, of the Caucasus Mountains in Eastern Europe, where I was at earlier this year. The sun had just broken through the, the clouds in the evening and it's cascading its light on the mountains below. One thing I love about photography is the texture and colors you can create from a photograph. This image here just beckons you to call, beckons you to come and sit under this tree and rest, but I lo love just the moss that covers it, the sunlight peeking through, and just all the surrounding vegetation, it just all comes together in harmony. Another key element of photography, of landscape photography, is composition. The sunrise shot of this arch was gone in a matter of seconds, but I planned to be there before sunrise and capture it when it eliminated the uh, underside of this arch. One of the great things I love about landscape photography is the element of surprise. I went to shoot a waterfall that's just out of the frame of this picture, but as I was leaving, the sun had come through the forest canopy and was just illuminated the whole forest, and everything just turned a really bright, vivid green. And so I jumped in the river with my shoes on and set my camera on tripod and just fired away and turned up to be one of the best images. Another element of photography is patience. I saw this shot at high noon just driving down the road going 70 miles an hour. I knew coming back at a sun sunrise would be the best time to, sh to shoot it. And so I spent two weeks trying to get this shot going back every morning, setting up in the dark. This is another shot that took not two weeks, but six months to capture. I saw this in the spring when it was totally green and lush, and I knew coming back in the fall, the colors were gonna change, and sure enough, the yellows and oranges and reds just really popped, and with the right light, the scene just came alive. The vision I have for my photo photography artwork is to adorn people's homes, their businesses and offices. I want to create windows into an outdoor world that may not have ever seen. Um, these these uh, prints are available on high-definition high aluminum panels as well as uh, face-mounted acrylic. In the future, I'm going to be offering workshops on one day, just one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, doing one-day group sessions, and also doing week-long adventure trips around the U.S. and overseas abroad as well. If any of these pieces interest you or if you want to check out my website, feel free to do so. If you want to learn about, more about photography, how to use your camera, I'm uh, very happy <coughs> to do that. Um, so please contact me with any information or how can, I can bring beauty into your house or your office. Thank you. My name is Regina Allen and I'm a painter. I grew up in the rolling hills of Nashville, Tennessee, and in my formative years as a young child, I lived in a house at the end of a dead-end street surrounded by forests, and I spent a lot of time exploring those forests when I was little. This is the 1970s, so one of the earliest artworks that I have is this weaving I did when I was about eight years old. I'm sure that I was watching, you know, John Denver and Grizzly Adams and all that sort of stuff too. But even then, I had an interest in landscape. Uh, between my junior and senior years of college, I did a study abroad in Italy, in Florence, where I studied art history and watercolor. And I would show up to my watercolor crits with these sweet little still lifes, and my teacher finally pulled me aside and said, look, stop trying to prove you know how to paint. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know how to do it. You're in Florence, you know, show me what you're really interested in. And it turns out I was interested in landscape and cityscape. So I did a series of watercolors based on those, and I ended up applying that same idea to uh, satellite images of the earth um, in my 20s and I folded in some ecological and environmental issues that I was just starting to get interested in 
This is the 1990s, and that was just starting to kind of hit the public consciousness. These are large, expressive oil paintings, and these are what I used to get into grad school. Unfortunately, my first year of grad school wasn't so positive, and in fact, my abstract kind of landscapes actually received a lot of negative feedback, with one teacher even telling me I didn't know how to paint. So for better or for worse, I showed up at my final crit, ironically, with a still life painting, my final crit of my first year. And I got a lot of positive feedback on that. And so that ended up influencing me, and my work moved from abstraction to a little bit more realistic figurative painting. Um, in my early 30s, I did a series of portraits of women from pinup uh, pinup posters and I used textile designs in the background. I had a solo show of this. I was about four months pregnant and married at the time and I moved soon after this show from Chicago to Austin, Texas in 2002 for the first time. I had my, my child and I didn't have a whole lot of time to paint after that so I, I jettisoned the stuff I wasn't interested in which included the portraits but kept the textile design. And with this I made pieces that I felt like were abstract landscapes and I put little figures in there. Most of those were figures of women in some form of bondage. Um, and that kind of reflected where I was as a new mom. I was a little bit shell-shocked, feeling like I didn't have a lot of support, um, and kind of reeling from that. Uh, we moved to LA for a few years, and I continued to make these what I considered large, kind of abstracted, fantastical landscapes. Um, and because I had a young child, I ended up working in collage a lot, because that was a little bit faster and more immediate for me to get my work done. In um, August of 2011, we moved back to Austin for the second time, and that is during the drought. It was like 109 degrees every day. And being back in such an extreme environment, especially coming from LA, it really brought to mind for me um, some of the environmental issues I'd been interested in before in the 20s that I hadn't really been exploring. So I started to incorporate ideas of flooding and drought into my work, but I was starting to feel restricted by the textile design, the flatness of it, the hardness of the edges. I was really feeling um, like I wanted to get back to a more expressive style. So I started to look again at photographs like I had done in my 20s, and I, I zeroed in on photos of storm-ravaged areas, places where tsunamis or hurricanes had kind of devastated the landscape. And I started to work in uh, more expressive watercolor uh, pieces. And um, these were, I was trying to find a hopeful twist on this, on this idea and um, to try to give a sense of sort of a leap forward in technology or in point of view that would um, address climate change. But honestly, looking at the photo images of the, the stormy areas was really kind of anxiety inducing. So I shifted my perspective towards satellite imagery again, kind of coming back around to where I was in my 20s. And in the satellite imagery, I actually look to zero in on areas where I see conflict between people and their landscape. So this could be boundaries where cities end and the water begins, or where cities end and the desert begins, or um, maybe where irrigation stops and the dry areas start, developed areas and undeveloped areas. Um, and in that conflict or in that visual tension, um, for me, I find really compelling imagery to work with. I've returned to working with oil paint. I've really been falling in love with oil paint again. And um, that's the sort of sensuousness of it. And for me, uh, what I'm really trying to express is that enduring quality of the landscape. Um, so I have really enjoyed this workshop. I hope you guys will stay in touch. And this is my contact information. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Rachel Wolfson-Smith. Um, and I make giant drawings of car and motorcycle crashes that are actually about people. Um, after doing years and years of field research as a devote, uh, devout car nerd and even four years as a lowly valet, <laughs> I finally came to the conclusion that a lot of people express their identity through what they drive. Um, I was a landscape painter for 10 years because it let me study painting and anthropology and archaeology. Um, people leave clues about their histories on the streets, remnants of their past in old buildings, clues of their present in cars and sandwich shops, and even signs of future changes on billboards and advertisements. Painting these places makes me feel like a spy, secretly taking notes on the street. My curiosity about landscape painting led me all over the world. I've lived in different cities, on farms, in suburbia, villages in Turkey, and I've documented people's cars and homes along the way. And the more I saw, the smaller the world started to seem to me. 
Um, we basically all do pretty similar things, just in different ways all over the world. Um, I was really drawn to the beauty of the things people own but can't hide, like the facades, the front of their homes and the cars parked outside where they work and shop. So I painted the things we can see from the street, eventually working from photos taken with a camera rested on my sh shoulder while I kind of drove by places to get stock footage. Um, but they never included people because we accidentally judge each other even if we don't mean to. So landscape painting is kind of slow and it let me, um, I guess I'm getting a little bit behind, sorry guys. <laughs> so anyway, um, we accidentally judge each other uh, and I never wanted to exploit people. I wanted to find that for other people to find something recognizable um, in the scenes that I was showing. So beyond the identity of the vehicles, the similarities across cultures and situations led me to ask what else we have in common. The deep stuff, the challenges, the ups, the downs, life's mysteries, and classically this has been dealt with through myth. So myths are really just stories that help us when we're confronted with problems. Bible stories, fables, superhero movies, they're all myths. So we watch the characters grapple with consequences so we don't have to. But through them, we gain the tools that teach us how to deal with more complex and hopefully less dramatic scenarios. So I started to invent. I combined the vehicle identity I was always seeing with the myth stories I was reading about that brought us together what we had in common, a shared experience of loss, grief, temptation, consequence, bravery, or the underdog. You'll notice that there's an ambiguity to the subjects. Um, they're hidden behind helmets and windshields because I want you to be able to find yourself in them to relate and kind of find the hero when the outcome isn't clear and it's really never clear. Um, but the irony is that in life, things aren't ambiguous. We're grouped by interests, facades, our gender, and our color. I make my drawings that way too um, in a defunct video that you're not gonna be able to see in two seconds. <laughs> so I make them for multiple reads. So I'm working really additively and subtractively, making my marks with a pencil, breaking those lines up with the razor, just kind of destroying things. Um, tiny pencils doing giant things. I fight to get the writers in space, fight to make these forms feel full, and fight to get the composition to lead you around the page, kind of finding the story as you go. Uh, my compositions are kind of like a matrix to me. Um, they're sort of algorithms. I'm working with gestalt grouping principles, divisions of thirds and fourths, the golden mean. And then I selectively darken things so that the viewer is kind of unconsciously led through the page to sort of discover the narrative if they so choose to. They also look extremely different from far away and close up, kind of getting abstracted in this mess of marks. Um, a lot of times they'll feel like a film still or kind of a modern interpretation of an epic renaissance battle scene um, with clustered riders, black and white kind of film noir feel. Um, right now, however, I am working with the Austin Fire Department to do, I'm um, doing a residency um, where I'm working to research, document, and connect with them to make six permanent works. And here you see them looking over the drawings I've done in-house at six of those stations. Um, coming up, I am making a mural that's in progress up there, will look more like that, um, at Pump Project, and that will be up during East. Um, this is a female writers to whom writing has been transformational, and um, there's, as it comes along, there will be blog posts on my website, which you'll have to memorize because it's off. <laughs> but uh, there'll be blog posts on my website that kind of document um, who each of these people are and how you can kind of find out more about their story and how that's been transformative to them. Um, thank you, guys. Hi, my name is Juanita. And um, I'm a filmmaker. And my website is called Wanna Be Good. And are we going? OK. So on the left, that's my great-great-grandmother, Minnie. She was a suffragette. And that's my um, great-aunt, Frances, who raised up hawks in her house. And I'm not, I can't remember now why I put them. That's me. <laughs> and um, I was born, I did tell you all that I was born a communist vegan, and I was not lying. Um, and so I had some early successes. 
With art, I wrote and directed my first play by the age of five. I won the Jim's Cafeteria Menu Contest. <laughs> Hashtag waterbeds. <laughs> and, um, and then I became a teenager and I didn't, I just didn't do a lot of stuff after that. <laughs> I didn't really. I think I became too shy to make anything and to, I don't know, I'm still too shy to make anything. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. <laughs> and I did a lot of other stuff, I did a lot of other stuff to not, anything I could do to create. One, I mean, I rode a bike to Mexico, I traveled a lot, I had a lot of different um, experiences that, you know, traveled, you could call it running, but I also read a lot of Buddhist books I didn't practice meditation, but I liked the feeling that I got when I would like read people who did. <laughs> and I still do that with self-help books, though. Um, and I, but still, I wasn't really writing like I did when I was a kid. But then I met this palm reader and a couple of different psychics over my journeys, as you might imagine I would. And they were like, you need to write, girl. So. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> and um, that sounded good to me. I needed something to do. It was kind of getting boring. So then I was studying at Goddard College and I started writing a lot. And I was just kind of messing around doing comedy, specifically like women in comedy. I thought I was going to be like a poet or something, but it's not really, uh, like a poet, essayist, but that's not really what ended up happening. I fell in love with comedy. Um, and oh, so I was out with a bunch of girlfriends. We were all dancing. One of them said, no, I didn't have a good time. This guy was rubbing his boner all over me the whole time. And all of us said, that happens to me. I hate it when that happens. And I thought that's so interesting that not everyone knows that. So I wrote this, I made this video called Boner Blocker. And ever since then, <laughs> ever since then, I've just been making films. And um, I just, that's me directing. Uh, these guys to make out because I realized I had seen a million women make out for men, but I hadn't seen any men make out for women, so I wanted to put that in one of my films. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I don't really even still, I don't, I think it's like kind of a compulsion that I have, and, I, and it's a compulsion I want to see people who haven't been making media make media, and I don't even fully understand. That's an all female crew that we just shot something a few weeks ago. Um, and film is, like a lot of industries, is very male dominated. I also work in film as a producer. Um, and I'm often the only woman, so I like to, I don't know, it's like a compulsion. This is some of my work. But um, yeah, I just, <laughs> um, it's all comedies and, that's, um, yeah, I just think it's really important. I think because I spent so long not making work. Um, I forgot to say was that reading all those Buddhist books did help me because there is this idea that like you can pay attention to what makes you uncomfortable and I forgot to say that that's what I write about is what makes me uncomfortable <laughs> so the Buddhist books kind of helped me to, um, to, to notice oh and I did learn how to meditate and I do meditate now so. <laughs>